Everybody talks about peace. Tony Blair talks about peace. George Bush talks about peace. We're fighting for peace. We're blowing for peace. We're doing this for peace. We want peace. Everyone wants peace. That Islam is the only way to establish true peace. Ibrahim Green. He doesn't need any introduction. When he came here in the 1996, he was well received and he's quite popular here. Anyway, let me go through for the benefit of those who are new. Brother Abdurrahim Green, formerly Anthony Green, embraced Islam in 1988. And he is, since then has been a very active Dai in the UK and he gives a lot of lectures in the Hyde Park, London. Now I request Brother Abdurrahim Green to deliver his lecture. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmuduhu wa nastainuhu wa nastaghfiruhu ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات عملنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له وما يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحد حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. We begin by praising Allah. We praise Him. We seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. And we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify and bear witness that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the servant of Allah and his messenger. After that, the best speech is the book of Allah and the best way, the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the worst of all the affairs are those matters that have been newly introduced into the religion and every matter that is newly introduced into the religion of Islam is an innovation and all of those religious innovations are misguidance and all misguidance is going astray and all going astray is in the fire. My brothers and sisters in Islam, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you. Today there is going to be one dominant theme and the theme as you can see is peace. Peace to humanity, peace, vision of Islam. Really, peace. Why do we want peace? Why? What's so good about peace? Everybody talks about peace. Tony Blair talks about peace. George Bush talks about peace. We're fighting for peace. We're blowing for peace. We're doing this for peace. We want peace. Everyone wants peace. You know, you don't have to question for a minute that peace is a good thing because we know that that's what we want. And if your religion's any good, your religion is going to preach peace and teach peace. Yeah? Okay. Why do the human beings want peace? Why? Tell me. Can anyone, I want you to tell me personally 
why you want peace. Why do you want peace and not war? Why do you want peace and not something other than peace? So can you give me a few ideas? Help me along. What's so good about peace? I, I'm asking you this. I tell you something amazing. My dad, my dad, he went to Egypt. In fact, my dad lived in Egypt for 10 years. And he was a merchant banker there. And recently he went back to make a visit to a school that he opened there. And he gave a lecture there to young Egyptian boys. And the amazing thing he gave a lecture about, I couldn't figure this out exactly what my dad was going on about. He gave a lecture not about peace, but about war. And in fact, he talked about how much fun war was. And yes, he said, you're a young man and you will enjoy fighting. My father fought in the Second World War. And he loved it. And my dad, believe me, is not a bad man. If you meet my dad, you will say, how come he's not Muslim? He's such a nice guy. So many people said that. But seriously, I'm, some people actually enjoy fighting. They love it. So tell me, please, what is so good about peace? Why do we want peace? Can anyone tell me? To live in harmony. To live in harmony. Why do you want to live in harmony? Why? Why you, you know the guy, he's annoying you. Poof, why don't you just bash him up? Why you want to live in harmony? What for? Why don't you just fight all day? I mean, I look at my kids, <laughs> Abdullah and Bilal, all they do is fight, 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 fight. They seem to enjoy it. I don't enjoy it. <laughs> I know why I want peace. Why do you want peace? Seriously. I took some notes. I've got some ideas myself why I think people want peace. But I want to hear from you. Huh? Okay, that's a good start. We need peace to live. Yeah, we need peace to live. Why? What's the opposite of peace? Peace means war. Yes? And when there is war, you feel insecure. You feel that any minute, some bomb may blow up your house. You can't get the food you like. You can't do your job. Nothing feels happy. You feel disturbed. You feel your life is going to be lost. You feel your children are in danger. You feel your family is in danger. You don't know what's happening to your auntie and your uncle and mommy and daddy and wherever they are because the whole world is in confusion. And people don't like that. They don't like confusion. They don't like this disruption. They don't like this mad state of affairs. Mostly, generally, human beings like to, as he said, live. Live, get on with their life. That's what it is. We like to get on with our life with as little hassle as possible. With as much ease as possible. Is that generally true? Yeah? Yes. So that's why we like peace. We don't like war, we like peace. We don't like the idea I have to go out and fight and die and maybe I won't see my wife again and my family again. This is something frightening. It's something unnerving. Human beings generally, not all of them actually, history of the human being, if you examine the history of the human being, you will think it is not a history of peace, but it is a history of war. In fact, all the human beings seem to be doing most of the time is fighting and killing one another. But when we talk about peace as the absence of war, I think we are missing the point. Because most people, when they say peace, they think peace means no war. Yes? That's what they imagine. Peace means no war. But in my opinion, this is a very, very shallow and small understanding of what is peace. In fact, I don't really believe this is the correct understanding of what is peace at all. And in fact, even the people who talk about peace the most, they don't even believe that. Because as I began by saying, George Bush talks about peace as he's going to war. Yes? Because he's going to war for peace. We can laugh, but actually, actually, as a concept, it's not strange to the human being that we fight for peace. That we have war so we can live in peace. This is not a strange concept for the human being. 
So therefore, peace does not mean the absence of war. It doesn't mean that. Peace is something we feel inside. Peace is something we feel inside. It's a state of happiness. It's a state of joy. It's a state of calm, tranquility, serenity. We don't feel worried. We don't feel depressed. We don't feel sad. We feel at peace. So true peace is something that is inside the human being. It is not something necessarily outside. So this is in fact the true peace. The true peace is the peace that is inside the human being. And everything else in fact is a type of false peace. Because we witness many societies that claim to be at peace. If you listen and study the propaganda and the brainwashing of the West, one of the things they claim all the time is, look, liberal democracy has brought peace to our nations for 40 years or 50 years or 60 years since actually the Second World War, the most horrible conflict human beings have ever seen, okay? But let's leave that out, yeah? If you listen to the propaganda of the West, one of the things they say is, look, Germany and France and England and America and Canada and Australia, they are at peace. By that they mean they are not fighting each other. But is this really true? It's true they are not at war. It's true that these countries are not dropping bombs on each other right now anyway. But let's examine something else. Let's look at their societies. Let's look at America. The crime rate. Violent crime. Rape. Alcohol abuse. Drug abuse. Kids shooting each other in schools. Kids knifing each other in the streets. Gang warfare. Washington DC is called the murder capital of the world. Of the world. Not of America, of the world. A woman is raped in America. One woman, I think, is raped every three minutes in Canada. Or is it three women every one minute? One or the other. Whichever one it is, it's disgusting. In England, women, they interviewed women and they found that 80% of women did not feel safe to travel on the underground, you know, the public transport system at night. In England, we are, par we are afraid to let our children go and play outside because there are pedophiles, because we are hearing about people who are kidnapping children and sexually molesting them and murdering them in the most horrific way. And I want to ask you a question. Can we really say that is peace? No, this is not peace. We find people are depressed. People are depressed. They are taking drugs like Valium drugs because they are clinically depressed. They are so depressed they need to take drugs to make themselves feel more happy. They drink alcohol and they take ecstasy and so many drugs and intoxicants. Does this sound like people who are at peace? No. In fact, you see, the promise of peace is a very narrow one. It's a very narrow concept. And this, in fact, is something that we have fallen into the trap of thinking the same thing. And we shouldn't do this. My contention tonight, and what I want to try and show tonight, is that Islam brings peace. True peace. The true peace of the soul, the peace and tranquility that is in the heart and the soul of the individual. And this is the true peace. And in fact, I will say, without this peace, 
Without this peace of soul, without this peace of mind, without this tranquility inside the human being, there will never ever be true peace on this earth. Never. And I will say more than this, that Islam is the only way to establish true peace. There is no other religion, there is no other way of life that is able to give the human being true peace and true happiness. Now what are my reasons for that? How practically does Islam give us this peace? How practically does Islam give us this peace? The first and the most important thing that I want to touch upon is what the Muslim believes. What does the Muslim believe? The Muslim has a belief that is so sensible, that is so rational, that makes so much sense, that there will never be a confusion in the mind of the Muslim between what his or her religion teaches in terms of what we believe and the intelligence. You will find most other religions and most other philosophies, they do not make much sense. In fact, many religions rely on the fact that, or the idea that, many religions rely on the idea that religion isn't supposed to make any sense. Religion is supposed to be nonsense. It's superstition. It's spiritual. It's something other than this world. So how can you subject it to your intellect? In fact, sometimes they will say, the more nonsense it is, the more true it must be. Yes, I have heard this said. One famous writer, I don't know if you've heard of him, his name is Graham Greene. He is a very famous writer anyway. If you study English literature, you, maybe you will study Graham Greene. And he is also famous because he converted from one part of Christianity to another part of Christianity. I don't want to mention which one. The reason he said, why did he convert to this other Christian? He said, because it doesn't make any sense. The reason I became this type of Christian is because it doesn't make any sense. And the more mysterious it is, and the more nonsensical it is, the more I think it must be a true religion. This is his idea of religion. Religion is supposed to be confusing. But why? And if your religion, which is the foundation of your whole life, what you believe is the foundation on which your whole life is built. If your foundation is confusing, if your mind is confused about that, how can you ever have peace? How can you ever have happiness? Because always you will be saying, wait a minute, but that doesn't make any sense. But this is confusing and you will never feel happy. But how about the teaching of Islam? Islam gives the most rational and acceptable explanation in order to understand this world and this universe in which we live. We look at the universe, we look at our world, we look at ourselves and we see that this universe and this world and our own selves operates according to amazing laws. The most intricate and complicated and beautiful systems. The human brain is infinitely more complex and has a huge and really incredible greater computing capacity than the world's fastest supercomputer. There are more connections in our brain than there are atoms in the universe. This is just a human brain. We look at the stars, the alternation of the night and the day. We look at our eyes, our liver, our heart, our kidneys. We look at the symbiotic relationship between the creatures and not only the creatures, but the creatures, the animals, the insects, and even the sun and the air. And we find everything working according to a system. 
Now, human beings, our experience tells us that when we see the simplest thing, a pen, we know someone made this pen. Do you have any doubt that someone made this pen? Have any doubt? How about my mobile phone? Did someone make this? I think you're more sure that someone made the mobile phone than the pen, yes? What is my mobile phone made of? Do you know what it's made of? Essentially two things, sand and oil. Yes. The silicon, silicon, the silicon chip, yeah? Is from what? Sand. And plastic comes from oil. And I happen to have a case here made of leather. Okay? So let's say a dead animal. So in my mobile phone here, I've got sand, oil, and a bit of a dead animal. Okay? Where, which place in this earth has lots of sand and oil? Name me a place. Okay, Saudi Arabia. Lots of oil and lots of sand. No, no, this was not made by anybody. I was walking along one day in the desert of the Saudi Arabia and I found this mobile phone sitting there and it's a product of chance and coincidence. The sun was shining, the oil was spewing, there was maybe a volcanic explosion, the lightning hit it and after millions and millions of years, this mobile phone formed itself just by coincidence out of the sand and oil. You believe that? You believe it? Does that make any sense? Is that even a fairy story? It's not even a, you couldn't even make a fairy story out of that. It's so stupid. Yet people want to tell us that this universe, that you and me, that the animals and the trees and the sky and the moon and the stars and the sun, they are a product of coincidence. Yet they are much more complicated than even this mobile phone. So how can a human being ever feel at peace when they have such a stupid, ridiculous belief? How? Because in the back of their mind, they will always know that this is impossible, that they are fooling themselves, that this is so unlikely and so improbable, but they have staked their whole life on it and they have built their whole existence on the idea that there's no God, this is just a product of chance and coincidence. When I die, the worms will eat me, the dust will eat me, that's it. How can anyone have peace thinking something like that? It doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense that when we look at this amazing universe, to think that and to understand that there must be something that is so wise and so powerful and so intelligent that has created this universe. And that has organized it and sustains it. And also, it is sensible to understand the thing or the being that created this universe cannot be the same as the universe. It can't be the same. It can't be a part of the universe. It can't be the same as the universe. If there is some being that created this world, then that being, we would say, if it's part of the universe, would also need a creator. So it's not truly the creator. Sure, the mobile phone has been made by a human being. But if the mobile phone needs a human being to make it, the human being is even more in need of a creator. So the creator must be something different. He can't be the same as the universe. The creator must be something without a creator, without a beginning, without an end, everlasting. And there cannot be two creators. How could there be two creators? If there were two creators, the world and the universe would not exist. It would be confusion. It would be chaos. And in fact, the more we look at the universe, and the more we study the universe, in fact, what becomes amazing is that the whole universe has this underlying unity. And in fact, science, when you really study it, 
shows us more and more that there must be one creator of this universe. And this is what Allah, He is telling us in the Quran. If you look and you see the signs in Allah's creation, the alternation of the night and the day, the camels upon which you ride, the ships on which you sail, in yourselves, on the furthest horizons, in these things are signs for those people who are wise and who understand. Therefore, the belief that is taught by Islam is one that makes so much sense. That there is one God who has created this universe, who sustains it and has brought it into existence, who is mighty and powerful and wise. And then again, the human being will ask themselves something. In fact, you'll find all human beings are asking themselves this question. Why am I here? What is it for? What is the reason of my existence? What is the purpose of my life? It's a very strange question, really. It's a very strange question. If I ask you, for example, what is your eye for? What's the eye? What is it for? Yeah, to see. Thank you. Okay. The eye is to see and the nose is to smell. Okay. And these slippers, what are your shoes for? Huh? What do they do? They protect your feet. Protect your feet. Think about it. Every single part of your body has a purpose. Your shoes have a purpose. Your watch has a purpose. Your glasses have a purpose. If you study the creatures, you will find that each animal has a purpose and a special place in the creation. The sun has a purpose, the moon has a purpose, the stars. There is a reason for the existence of all of these things. And we're not confused about that. But then the human being is asking, what is my purpose? Why am I here? I know what my eyes are for, I know what my nose is for, I know what my shoes are for. But me, I don't know what I am for. I don't know the purpose of my life. Huh? So, how can a human being ever be at peace when he knows his shoes have a purpose, his glasses have a purpose, huh? my eyes have a purpose, but me, I don't know what's my purpose. Will you be happy? Will you be happy? I don't think any human being can be happy like that. Thinking that they are more worthless than the pen they write with, because the pen has worth, I know what it's for. Me, I don't know what I'm for. Now if we want to know the purpose of our life, and we want to know the reason for our existence, from where are we going to get this knowledge? From where are we going to get this information? We could become like the philosophers, sit and think and think and think and think, but if you study philosophy, you will find that every single philosopher came up with a different idea. Every philosopher came up with a different idea. Whether it's Aristotle or Plato or Descartes or whoever they may be, they came up with all with different ideas. What's the purpose of life? Some of them even maybe there's no purpose in life. Science will not answer this question. Where do we find the answer to this question? The answer to this question can only come from the one who created us. The one who created the human being. The one who made us knows the answer to this question. What the creator made us for? Why are we here? What's our life for? What's the reason for our existence? And in fact, if you think about it, the only answer that will satisfy you 100% is when you know the one who made me told me this is why he made me. No other answer will make you really happy inside your heart. So we, if we want to know what is the purpose of life, we need that knowledge from God. We need that knowledge to come from our Creator. But how do we get that knowledge? What do we do? How do we get that knowledge? Now people may suggest different things. 
Maybe God just left some book lying around somewhere with all that knowledge in it. Huh? Or maybe God teaches every single person that knowledge. But if you think about both of these things, there are many disadvantages to those type of concepts. For example, if you have a book, really in order to explain this book, in order to explain everything will have to be very, very big. When I bought this mobile phone, I got something very important in the box with the mobile phone. Now me, I'm not very well versed in technology. So something very important came with this mobile phone. Does anyone know what that thing was? Instruction manual. And believe me, it was a big instruction. It was thicker than this pad of paper. Big instruction manual. How about the human being? We are even more complicated than the mobile phone. How about our instruction manual? If we don't even know what is the purpose of our life, how about living the life? How about fulfilling the created purpose? We need guidance from the one who made us. My phone is made by Nokia. I don't need the phone, the book from Sony. I don't need the Panasonic book. I need the book from Nokia. Okay? Do the human beings need the guidance of Marx or Lenin? Huh? Do they need the guidance of some human being to tell them, live your life like this and like that? No. They didn't make us. What do we need their guidance for? They themselves, they need guidance. Yes, they themselves need guidance. We, we human beings, we want guidance from the one who made us. That makes sense. And you know what? Imagine every time you bought a mobile phone, the mobile phone company sent along a personal advisor to teach you how to use it. What would you think of that? Huh? Good service. Yes? You would, be, you would say, you would tell everyone, get these guys are amazing. Not only do they give you the phone and the instruction manual, they send someone along to teach you exactly what to do. And he will stay with you until you know how to do it. That's great, huh? You have to admit, that's good. So think, isn't it fantastic? That not only did Allah the Creator, our Creator and the Creator of all the things in this universe, send the human beings a book, well he sent in fact many books, but the last of those books he sent is the Qur'an. And with the Qur'an, Allah sent a practical example to teach us how to follow this Qur'an. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. So Allah, He sent the instruction manual and He sent the Prophet to teach us practically how to follow that guidance. And when you study the Qur'an, and when you read the Qur'an, an amazing thing happens. Your heart becomes very happy. And you become very convinced that this is from God. Like some other books, and I have read many books before I became Muslim, I studied many different religions. And I read the books of many different religions. In fact, I remember one religion was telling me that the earth, the earth is resting on an elephant, which is standing on a tortoise, which is swimming in the sea. Yeah, this one religion I came across said this. Does this sound like a religion from the one who created the universe? No, it sounds like a Someone was thinking, well, how can I tell my child these things and they made this bedtime story? Huh? Or like when I used to study Greek and Latin at school, we used to study ancient Greek and Latin, and with that we would study the stories of the gods of the ancient Greeks. So one of the stories of the gods of the ancient Greeks was that there was one goddess, she was breastfeeding her baby, the baby god, and it bit her nipple and the milk came out and that's the Milky Way. Does that sound like a book that's from God? No, it doesn't. It does not sound like a book that's from God. When you read the Quran though, what do you find? It is a mentioning things 
that scientists have only begun to discover today have not the unbelievers in Surah Al-Anbiya the meaning have not the unbelievers seen that the heavens and the earth were joined together then they were rent asunder and we created from water every living thing subhanallah will they not believe the Quran mentions how Allah turned to the heavens when it was dukhan smoke and many, many amazing things the Quran mentions that nobody could have known 1,400 years ago. So now you see, how does Islam bring peace? First of all, there is one God who created the universe. And God is not like anything in this universe. He is unique. He is eternal and ever living, wise and powerful. And you know what? That makes sense. And I feel at peace with that. Because my reason and my belief, they are not fighting each other. And God has sent guidance. And when I look at this guidance, the Quran, this book you can see must be from God. And you look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of God, and when he lived his life, you feel at peace because you will see that this man is the real example of how to be a good human being. And this you see when we know our aqidah, and I'm only mentioning some few things. The more you study, and the more deeply you look into this belief of the Muslim, whether it is the belief in Allah and the angels, or the books and the scripture, or the day of judgment, which really we think about it. I know someone who used to be an atheist, but even when he was an atheist, he didn't believe in God. He used to say, you know what? But I really, it would be really good that there's a day of judgment. Because there are so many bad people who do so many bad things and they don't seem to get punished for it. And it will be so good that there is a day of judgment when they get what they deserve. Yes. Because this is the logic, the reason. It makes sense. Because we have within us this natural desire to see justice. So the day of judgment, really it makes sense. And that there is a place of reward and a place of punishment. A reward for the people who do good and punishment for the people who do bad. So you see the belief of Islam. In fact, when you study it, you will find nothing that is in contradiction with the sound reason and the Qadr, and the divine decree, and the destiny, really makes so much sense. So when the believer, their mind has acquired this knowledge, their heart becomes peaceful and at rest. And really I am mostly sure, mostly, I don't want to say in every case, but when you find some Muslim who is very sad or very depressed, or in a very bad mental state, when you study that person, you will find, in fact, at the bottom of it, there is something wrong, something weak in their belief. Something weak, or something wrong. And you will maybe find they are, they have some corrupt belief at the, not always, I don't want to say every time, but really many times you will find this is the case. And the more strong your knowledge, and the more firm your belief, true belief here, because I have to say, unfortunately, many people who call themselves Muslims have many very wrong beliefs that in fact even contradict Islam. But the true belief brings the true peace and the true happiness. And this is how Islam brings true peace to society. Because when we have peace in ourself, and then we establish that peace, in our family, then that peace will become established in society. And because Islam is the Quran and the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it is the guidance from Allah, the one who created us and the one who knows us. When we practice Islam and when we implement Islam, See, Islam is not just a belief. Islam is not saying, my name is Muhammad, my name is Aisha, my father used to pray. No. Islam is something we have to practice and we have to implement in our lives. Then we will see how our life will change.
and our family's life will change. And in fact, we will see how the life of the society will change. Now, brothers and sisters, I mentioned this is a type of spiritual sense that I am mentioning, but I also want to mention now some practical things. Everything in Islam is practical. Everything that we do as Muslims is going to help to make your life a peaceful life. In fact, I will say this without any doubts. Every single problem that we have, every single problem that we have, and I don't exclude any problem, all our problems, individually and collectively, they come from our disobeying Allah and abandoning the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Without a doubt, all of our problems come from this. That's what our problems are due to. And the more we implement Islam, the more happy and the more at peace we will be. But it's the true peace, brothers and sisters. I don't mean necessarily that you will not be tested because Allah says in the Quran that we will test you, the meaning of what Allah says. We will test you with your family, with your businesses, with your homes, with your health. Allah is going to test us with all of these things. But the person who has true faith and is truly following Islam, then these things will not affect the peace and the tranquility and the happiness. In fact, it will increase that for them. So Islam is the way in every aspect, whether it's growing the beard, whether it's wearing hijab, whether it's the smallest using the miswak, whether it's not eating pork, not drinking khamar, whether it's smiling, subhanAllah, it's the sunnah of the Prophet to smile. They said, they used to say that no one used to smile as much as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whether it's the smallest thing or the biggest thing, Islam is going to help you and help your family and help your society. I want to pick a few things. I want to pick just a few things to show how Islam really practically can change the society. Everything does it. Praying five times a day, fasting Ramadan. But there are a few things that I want to concentrate on. One of the things that I want to mention, how Islam brings a peaceful society, is let's turn this upside down. What are the things that make society what are the things that makes society disturbed and disruptive? What are the things that disturb society? Most of it you will find the worst things are conflicts between the human beings. And what are those conflicts based on? Many of them are based on what? Race and class or caste. Those are two of the things. Another thing is the difference between the sexism we can call it, I don't know what name we want to give it. That's another cause for conflict. Jealousy, envy, these are some things that cause the conflict. Greed, lust, these are some of the things that cause the conflict. And in fact, Marshall, if you go and look in the exhibition, most of those things I've seen in different places have been mentioned. But we see how Islam teaches the believer, the Muslim, to resist all of these things. The believer is really warned against envy and greed. Really, Islam, the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ also warned us against envy and greed. In fact, Islam is teaching us that this world, this dunya, it's just the moment that we have. The moment that we have. And that's all it is. It's like that. It's just a moment, brothers. It's just a moment, sisters. And it's over. I can't believe that Jifri was telling me the last time I was in Madras was six years ago. I thought, six years? Six years, I can't believe it, that it's gone that quickly, it's the life. 
But that's all we've got. This fleeting moment to do what? Build a nice house? Have a nice car? Make lots of money? Put it in the bank? That's not what the life is for. Get a good education, get a degree, this and that. Most of us, we're running after these things. You're not going to take your house with you to the grave. You're not going to take your car with you to the grave. You're not going to be able to stand in front of Allah and wave your PhD or your son's PhD. No. There's only one thing that is going to go to you, with you into the grave. One thing, your deeds. The good deeds and the bad deeds. And there is only one thing that Allah is going to weigh for you on the day of judgment. One thing, your deeds. That's it. The good deeds and the bad deeds. So it's dead simple, brothers and sisters. It's not confusing. Whose ever scale of deeds is heavy with good, they will have a beautiful, happy, blissful life in paradise. But whoever's scale of deeds is heavy with bad, they will go to hell fire. It's that simple. So the only thing this life is about is getting as many good deeds as you can and getting rid of and keeping away from as many bad deeds as you can. That is it. The rest of this world and everything in it has no benefit except what is going to help you reach paradise and make you avoid the hellfire. That is it. If you think anything else, you have been deluded by this world it has deceived you and conned you and taken you for a ride and you have been fooled and tricked. You've been fooled and tricked as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Isa ibn Maryam mentioned this that the world is like an old woman who made herself so beautiful with all the makeup and she adorned herself and then she invited people to come to her. So these are the people. The people who went with the world are like the one that went with this old, old woman who tried to make herself look young. They got fooled because in fact, it's nothing. There's nothing there. Nothing you're going to benefit from except what you take to get to the Akhirah. So where is greed in that? Where does greed figure in the person who believes that. Where is the need for greed? Except you are greedy to do good deeds. I'm greedy to help my brother. I'm greedy to help my neighbor. I'm greedy to do the good deeds. And I'm greedy to leave the evil deeds. That's a good type of greed. Alhamdulillah. And envy. Why do you want to envy? How can you envy somebody? You know what envy is? Envy is when you want what the other person has got and you want that person to be deprived of it. He's got a nice car. I wish I had that car and he didn't. Why? Who gave him the car? Who gave that man the car? Who gave the man the car? Who? Allah. Allah gave him that car. Why you want to take away from him what Allah gave to him? Why? What the people have is what Allah has given to them. Why you want to end? Why you want them to be deprived of it and you to have it? Maybe Allah kept that thing away from you because it would corrupt you and make you bad. If you understand truly qadr and you truly have faith in Allah, you will not feel envy. You see how Islam makes the peace in the society between the people? You take out envy and you take out greed and then you take out lust because that causes so many problems. A man lusting after another man's wife or his daughter. How many problems and how much destruction in society is caused by that? But we see Islam 
closing the doors. This is one of the beautiful things about the hijab. Even subhanAllah before the hijab, Allah is telling, let the believing men lower their gaze and let the believing women lower their gaze. You're not even supposed to be staring at these things. And racism. How can there be any racism in a Muslim? Subhanallah. How can a Muslim be racist? Although unfortunately, I have met plenty of people who call themselves Muslim who are racist. But how will a Muslim be racist? When we are all the sons and daughters of Adam, and Adam was made from dust. Subhanallah. We are all, every one of us, the sons and daughters of Adam, and Adam was made from dust. There is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab, over a black over a white, except in one thing, taqwa, piety. How much does that person fear Allah? How much does that person obey Allah? That is the only difference that our religion recognizes between the people in terms of superiority and inferiority. There is no place for racists in Islam. Islam is a religion that came to eliminate such false distinctions between the human beings. And how about classism or caste it goes back to the same concept of envy and greed we don't have a caste system in islam it always amazes me and i heard this from some muslims in india mostly i heard this from indian muslims i'm from such and such caste and my mother won't let me marry her because she's from such and such caste i said are you hindu or are you muslim i got confused what's your religion because we don't have any caste system in islam Islam does not recognize that. Islam does not recognize these things. The person's quality is in their taqwa, in their piety, in their obedience to Allah and His Messenger. Oh my brothers in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ said that if a man comes to you and he asks for your daughter's hand in marriage, and you are happy with his deen, and with his character, if you refuse, there will be great fitna and great facade upon the face of the earth. Fitna means trials and tribulations, and facade means illegal sexual intercourse. You will be responsible. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic tradition. I remember I went to give some talks in Guyana in South America, as part of the Caribbean. I was on the radio program and the man said, are you telling me, you white man, if me black man comes with my son, and he's Muslim, if my, if my son comes and you're a white man, and I say, my son wants to marry your daughter, you're not gonna refuse? I said, if he's Muslim, and his deen is good, and his character is good, I will not disobey the Prophet and cause facade and munkar on the earth. Why should I refuse? This is Islam. He said, that is really amazing. That's Islam. Imagine if we live like that, brother. We don't just talk it, we live it. You see our problems? How much fornication now? How many girls running off with boys? Is it true or not? Maybe you don't want to admit it. You know it's true. It's happening. Huh? Why? You know if you trace it back down, why? Because we did not obey Allah and His Messenger. So we see how Islam, when we practice it, is going to bring so much happiness and peace to society. But really, brothers and sisters, there's one very important concept and thing I have to mention. Brother mentioned it here. Sorry, I forgot the brother. Habib mentioned it. Jazakallah. I remember the Habib bit. Sorry, brother, wherever you are. Uh, Subhanallah, he mentioned it. I think some of the other speakers have mentioned it. He said a very important thing. And we have this same problem in England. The Muslims have this ghetto mentality. It's very sad and very dangerous. We live in ghettos. 
We isolate ourselves. We don't communicate with people. We don't let them know about our religion. And believe me, this is a path to destruction. You cannot, as Muslims living in a country where you are a minority, behave in that way. When it's a Muslim country and everybody's Muslim, well, alhamdulillah. But in this country or in England or some other country where we are a minority, our duty is to spread the message and to let people know about Islam. And that doesn't necessarily mean preaching to them. But it does mean that you need to behave like Muslims. You show them honesty and truthfulness and sincerity and fairness in your dealings. Fairness in your dealings and justice. I don't know about here in India, but in England, in England, unfortunately, Muslims have a reputation for being some of the worst crooks. They're the biggest cheaters in business. They're the ones never keep their promises. They're known for cheating the benefit system in England, the benefit system. Not all of them, alhamdulillah, they're good Muslims in England. But I'm saying many, they have acquired this reputation. How will we ever give dawah like that? I don't know in India how you are, but brothers, if even one of you is like that, it's too many. The Muslim keeps his promise because the sign of the hypocrite is when he speaks, he lies. When he makes a promise, he breaks it. When he's trusted with something, he betrays it. And when he argues, he does it in a rude manner. If you have one of those, you have one of the signs of nifaq, of hypocrisy. If you have all four, then you are a pure hypocrite. Because Islam and Iman and this type of behavior does not combine. So you brothers and sisters have a responsibility. A responsibility that is on every Muslim to enjoin the good and to forbid the munkar. We have to enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, if you see an evil, change it with your hand. And if you can't change it with your hand, change it with your mouth. And if you are not able to change it with your mouth, at least hate it in your heart. But that's the weakest form of faith. We are all obliged to change evil. Therefore, we should be the best example in society. Promoting decency, promoting goodness, and forbidding evil. If we were all like that, and if we all displayed these characteristics, and we lived Islam the way it should be lived, then people will criticize us. Because you know, brothers and sisters, they criticize Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said about the Prophet, he was a magician. They said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he was a sorcerer. They said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam many things. But you know what? When those people met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they said, that's not true. Those things they said about him were lies. In fact, he's the opposite. So they used to hate him the most. But when they met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know what? They loved him the most. But now today I want to ask an honest question. All of us ask an honest question. You know the propaganda against Islam. Muslims are terrorists. Muslims abuse their women. Muslims this. Muslims cheat. Muslims they are such and such. They are bad citizens. They are, you know, you know the list of things that they accuse us of. Now when they come and meet you, are they going to say, none of that is true. These people really are the best people and now I love them as I used to hate them. Or are they going to meet you and they're going to say, yeah, all those things they said, at least quite a few of them are true. And if quite a few of them are true, maybe the rest of them are true as well. Yeah, ask yourself. Ask yourself. And if you find that it's true, that you are not the best example, and that when people do come to meet you, they do not see the nur, and the light of guidance and goodness shining from you, then make your resolution today, brothers and sisters. I don't want anyone to clap their hands. 
If you appreciate what I said, you know what I would like you to do? I would like you to go away and change your life. No clapping hands, just change your life. That's what I would like. That would be the best thing, brothers and sisters. That is the way to appreciate what has been said tonight. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. How can you worship God without knowing and without having any real evidence that this is the way that God wants to be worshipped? Follow the book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and stick to the understanding of the companions who the people who understood Islam the best.